Greetings, friends and brethren. This is my third update on the crisis in Ukraine. Greetings to all of you from East Europe. The onslaught of the Russian forces against the Ukraine and the Ukrainian government forces has now entered into the second month. The purported aim, as the Russian sources would say, was to basically defend the Russian-speaking areas that were threatened by the Ukrainian government forces. The Russian forces claimed that uh, last month they discovered uh, the plan by the Ukrainian government forces to orchestrate uh, a a ethnic cleansing on the two Russian uh, territories, basically on the territories uh, populated by the Russian-speaking population, the territories of Donetsk and Lugansk. Ever since then, as you know, I've been giving you the most important details from this conflict, which uh, sadly has been caused not only by the Russians themselves, but also by the NATO and by the United States and by the European Union. Namely, the European Union and NATO have given false uh, and uh, false promises and guarantees to the Ukrainian government that their country would be admitted to NATO and that their country would be also admitted to the European Union. Now, the concern that Russians have had was that uh, the NATO is expanding its uh, sphere of influence and that the NATO will come right there to their threshold, right there to their borders. That's why the Russians also said that they have intervened in Ukraine in order to secure that the Ukrainians would have uh, a country that would be a sovereign country but neutral, meaning that it would not join the military bloc uh, called NATO, and also that uh, the guarantee would be there will be guarantees for the Russian speaking areas uh, as far as the human rights are concerned. Because in the last eight years, ever since the annexation of Crimean Peninsula by Russia, there have been various violations of the human rights and uh, oppression by the Ukrainian government forces against the Russian populated areas, against the two areas, Donetsk and Lugansk. Now, as I mentioned in one of my updates, those areas, including Crimean Peninsula, including Lugansk and Donetsk, they have historically never been really a Ukrainian territory. Uh, those territories were given to the Ukraine by the communist regime during the communist USSR regime, which for unknown reason decided to uh, cede those Russian-speaking areas, Donetsk, Lugansk and Crimean Peninsula, to Ukraine, and thus, basically, they separated those uh, Russian-speaking areas from their Russian mainland. As I mentioned to you, I think, in one of my updates as well, uh, the uh, Crimean people, the Crimean citizens, back in 2014, organized a democratic referendum in on which, of course, based on the guaranteed right for self-determination, uh, they basically voted for uh, returning to Russia, because that was historically their homeland, and it was democratically decided to be that way. So ever since Crimea joined the uh, mainland Russia, uh, the two other areas, the Donetsk and Lugansk Republic, uh, remained uh, the two Russian-speaking uh, population, Russian-speaking areas that were sadly targeted by the Ukrainian government as far as their uh, as, as far as their human rights are concerned, there were various kinds of oppressions and denials of human rights by the central Ukrainian government. That was Those were the things and the reasons why Russia decided to basically make this military campaign in Ukraine, and sadly it is, it is causing various uh, civilian and other, uh, other casualties. The Russians, when they entered the Ukraine, they said that the, they were not really targeting civilians, they were targeting the military, military targets, military facilities, etc. However, as it is inevitable in any war, uh, the <laughs> civilians, as well as civilian facilities and so on, uh, they become, sadly, uh, the collateral damage as NATO used as a term when they were bombing mercilessly Serbia for 78 days. And so now we have, as I said, we have entered the second month of this conflict. We all feel kind of tired because of this, because we are seeing terrible things happening, uh, people suffering, of course. Regardless of the Russian concern for the uh, for the civilians, it still does not spare the civilians from suffering. 
And as I've mentioned to you that my fears were that the city of Mariupol, the strategic port on the Azov Sea, a uh, strategic port that also is on the Black Sea, and it's, it has been used for exporting goods from Ukraine to the world, the city of Mariupol uh, would be, as I mentioned to you, most likely the most devastated area, the most devastated city in this conflict. And my fear was that there would be basically, it might be raised to the ground. Sadly, I'm not far away from the truth. Uh, for days now, we've been hearing about the humanitarian catastrophe within the city. Uh, only several thousand civilians that were trapped inside there were able to leave. Now, I, I need to remind you once again that the city of Mariupol is a Russian-speaking city. Uh, where equal number of Russians and Ukrainians lived. They all spoke Russian. There was some, uh, a significant uh, portion, significant segment of the Greek community. And there, was, there were also some other minor communities like Belarus, Bulgarians, Jews, etc., etc. The last Western diplomat who left the city of Mariupol was the uh, Greek consul who basically landed to Greece last week. He was the last uh, diplomat to leave the area because he was trying to help the trapped civilians of Greek origin in that city. And he mentioned in his statement to the press that the city of Mariupol has been basically destroyed. Right now, uh, as of the latest news, there are street fights uh, in the downtown of Mariupol because the city has been beleaguered uh, by the Russians. The city of Mariupol has uh, basically it, it touches one one side of that city touches the Ukrainian mainland however the other side of the city touches the Russian populated areas in eastern Ukraine namely the Donetsk National Republic as it is called now um, and uh, because it is a strategic point uh, the Russians basically besieged the city completely and cut it off from the rest of the world However, at the same time, after the conflict around Crimea, the Ukrainian government forces made the city like a fortified defense area. However, they have been pushed from the outskirts of the city of Mariupol straight into the downtown, and now the battles and the street fights are going on right now in that city. About 100,000 civilians remained trapped. The city used to have 400,000 people now about 100,000 civilians remain trapped without food, without water, without electricity. And it is a terrible and tragic tragic thing. Uh, Mariupol is the symbol, as far as I'm concerned, of the all kinds of Slavic discords and Slavic stupid, unreasonable conflicts. And oh, Slavic nations have so much hatred sown between them, so much discord that has been sown between them because of different religions, because of different ideological uh, goals, because of the different allies which they choose, and so on. Uh, the city of Mariupol has had, as I mentioned to you many times, the Russians certainly had to take that city, because the city provides a land corridor, a land connection between the Crimean Peninsula and also between the two uh, areas in eastern Ukraine populated by the Russians. Therefore, this strategic city had to be taken by the Russians, and it was clear to me that the Russians would not relent in their attack on the city. At the same time, Ukrainians, being stubborn as they are in their defense, also decided that they would use civilians as a shield within the city, and uh, there have been reports that in one of the greatest uh, steel factories in the world, Azovstal in Mariupol, that there have been some underground corridors dug and uh, that uh, now that steel factory is now the uh, how shall we say a defense line uh, and dear god knows for how long yet those conflicts that conflict is going to happen however the city of mariupol mariupol is almost raised to the ground and now with hopefully those who are still civilians trapped inside were trapped, they might be able to finally leave, and then at the end, there will be nothing left out of that city. That's so terrible, it just grieves my whole, my, my, my heart. But uh, I knew that would be the outcome of the Russian Ukrainian conflict. Now, Russians have also claimed 
that they managed uh, to establish a land corridor, a land connection between the Crimean Peninsula and the two uh, Russian populated areas in the east, in East Ukraine. Uh, they, of course, that part of that portion, one portion of that corridor goes <laughs> right next to the city of Mariupol. The Ukrainian government sources have confirmed that the Russians indeed have succeeded to do this. Uh, they also, however, claim the Ukrainian government forces that they have uh, inflicted several blows onto the Russian army. Uh, they also claim that around the Ukrainian capital Kiev, about 35 kilometers uh, northeast of Kiev that they have secured uh, a strong defense line and that they were able to push back uh, somewhat the Russian forces. However, as I mentioned to you, brethren and friends, many times, uh, there is no way that Ukraine can win this war with Russia. There is simply no way because, as you see, even NATO countries uh, are reluctant to um, enter into direct conflict and uh, Again, uh, you know, Russia is too strong for a country like Ukraine or for any other country for that matter. And therefore, from the very start, from the very onset of this war, it was clear to me that the Ukrainians are going to lose. Uh, even if their defense might be somewhat effective, there is no way that they can defend their country on the long run. And... Uh, it, it was very clear that the Russians could take it even faster. Some people wonder why has this military operation by Russia has dragged on for for this long. Well, it has been dragged on for this long because mainly because Russians really, at least in theory, have tried to spare civilians from suffering and they've been con cons consistently calling on the Ukrainian soldiers to put down weapons and that uh, if they do so, they'll be free to go home and, uh, you know, nothing will happen to them. The same happened in the city of Mariupol. Uh, it was on Monday, 5 a.m. was the deadline. The Russians offered the Ukrainian government forces within the city to put down their arms, lay down their, their arms, and that they would guarantee uh, them safe passage and that they would be released. However, the Ukrainian government forces refused, and therefore... The fierce battles day in and day out have continued. Right now, they're just fierce street battles and dear God knows the level of suffering of the civilians trapped inside. But again, as I told you, I have to underline that the city of Mariupol had to fall and it has to fall into Russian hands. The Russians will never allow that city to be like a pocket from which Ukrainian forces would be able to attack other Russian populated areas but whether that be Crimea, whether that be Donbas, Donetsk, and Lugansk Republic. Uh, so the Ukrainians claim that they're giving a strong resistance, which, yeah, there is no reason why we should not believe that. At the same time, however, the Russian side also has said that the shelling of the uh, Russian populated area Donetsk by the uh, Ukrainian government forces continues, continues even today. Uh, as far as the Lugansk, the other area populated by the Russians is concerned, uh, the Russian sources claim that 98% of that territory has been released or, or, or freed from the Ukrainian forces. Uh, I mentioned already the capital Kiev. Kiev is still resisting the Russian onslaught and uh, there have been significant damage to the second largest city in Ukraine called Kharkov. Kharkov also has a very significant Russian population, by the way. Now, let's, let me just uh, give you some update on the economic consequences of this war. Uh, Russia has created a list of so-called enemy states, those who voted in the United Nations against the Russian interest and those who voted to condemn the Russian attack on the Ukraine. And therefore, because Russia is a big exporter of gas, Russians have decided to uh, not use any other international currency like Euro. Russians have decided to charge their, their, their gas supply, uh, the gas supply which they by which they supply Europe. They, they have decided to charge the, the Russian currency, Rublia. And now that's, of course, a very smart move. Uh, why? Well, of course, Europe, European Union does not 
does not accept that. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, stated that uh, all the agreements which European countries have with Russia have been agreed upon one currency, which will be Euro, and because the transaction of gas is being done on the European territory, therefore it is expected that the currency used in those trade transactions would be Euro, and any other any other transaction would be illegal. But nevertheless, Russians have persisted, and this is what this, this was a smart move because now Europe still depends largely on uh, on gas coming from Russia. Therefore, in order to buy new supplies of gas, uh, they would have to buy the Russian currency and use that currency to pay uh, to pay the for gas supply. Uh, that smart move has made the Russian currency ruble remain steady. And even get, you know, stronger against uh, dollar and euro. There was another interesting development. It was the um, Chinese, the China approach to Saudi Arabia. And the two countries have been negotiating about the uh, oil trade. And the oil trade would be paid in the Chinese currency, yuan, rather than dollar. Now that's really, of course, a great concern uh, to the West because in that way, uh, it would be another economic blow to uh, uh, to U- U.S. and the EU economy, and at the same time, such a move would allow Russia to evade the economic sanctions imposed by the West. Uh, the economic sanctions are very broad; they're getting tougher and tougher with each passing week. But still, the war sadly has continued. The war has continued, and the latest reports show that the, uh, there is now a new offensive by the Russian forces. The Russian military sources have announced today that the first phase of their military operation, as they call it, has been done, has been finished. The first phase has been finished, and now they are saying that they are now entering into the second phase. And in the second phase, they are they, are, they have vowed to basically secure uh, the. Um, Russian populated areas, Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, and to make them safe. I guess they will make them safe either by installing some kind of peacekeeping uh, contingent, and those two areas would continue to be recognized by Russia as independent countries and would have very close ties with Russians, or, or perhaps they would, just like what happened with Crimea, there will be a referendum or whatever, and those two areas may join Russia and become part of the Russian mainland. There was just uh, about half an hour ago, there was another news coming from Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the Azerbaijan's forces, according to the Russians, the Azerbaijan forces have entered into the um, peacekeeping or peace-controlled area and have uh, and have established a, uh, a, 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 a... Well, it was called like a watch, watch post or a watching post or... A, watching kind of mission. Uh, Russia has claimed that. The Azerbaijan, Azerbaijanis, they, they, they deny that. But in any case, the state of war has been declared in this province, Nagorno-Karabakh. So that's another sad development in East Europe. Um, economy, as far as economy is concerned, uh, the, the prices of gas have drastically gone up. Uh, the government in my country, Serbia, has actually came up with a executive order that the uh, certain prices have to be have to be limited, so there will be no inflation, so to keep us all afloat. Uh, which means that the gas price has been fixed by the government, and it's fixed on certain you know to certain amount, and nothing can change it. Also, some staples have been have been decreed by the government to, you know, remain steady as far as the price is concerned because there is a fear that, you know, a huge inflation might just, you know, engulf our nation. That would be a catastrophe of its own sort. In other countries, uh, (laughs) a loaf of bread in Italy two days ago was like 10 euros per loaf, which was horrendous to read. Uh, The gas price, as it has gone up in in America, has gone up in, in other parts of Europe, uh, it has been reported from Britain that this is they have the, uh, the 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 worst inflation in the last forty years. I think something similar is happening in America as well. So there are consequences, economic consequences of this war. However, you need to understand that, <coughs> unlike European nations, 
and I think I mentioned this before, but I I feel I feel need to give you an honest report anyway, regardless of what people might say. And I know that there are those, there were only those who said that my last, my last, uh, the, my previous uh, uh, review, my previous report to you was uh, Russian propaganda and all that rubbish. Well, I'm very sad. I'm very sad to. Uh, I'm very sad to see this kind of uh, Nazi-like Nazi-like approach. But uh, before that, let me just mention. Let me just say what I want. I was going to say. I was going to say to you that the Russians are much tougher nation than uh, many other nations. You know, unlike soft Western countries and like soft Western Europe. You know, Russians have their history is just filled with. With, with, with fighting for their freedom, you know, um, heroic battles against the Nazis, against Napoleon's army and so on. Russians, you know, and some of them live in horrible conditions like, which go like 50 Celsius degrees below, you know, the temperature falling like 50, up to 50 Celsius, you know, uh, 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 50 Celsius uh, uh, degrees, which is, which are just living conditions that most of us would find unbearable. But Russians are crazy, in a sense. Russians are crazy because when they when they go for a cause, they'll just go. They'll just they'll just not uh, not not um, spare any uh, losses, victims, be that material, be that in goods, be that in people. They would not spare. They would not hesitate to use all the resources, including their own lives for the cause which they have before them, be that freedom, be that fighting for whatever cause. And sadly, uh, that would, again, the Western people, the Western people, simply the Western nations simply do not understand that. So they are finding, they're still, you know, faring somehow with all of these sanctions. They are going to find another alternative ways. They will indeed rely on our Asia and uh, South America, for example, and other countries, they're not, they're outside of American and European sphere. They may rely on them for trade and so on. They have a big friend called China, and China is help, ready to help them economically, and so on. So, I mean, all these sanctions, the point was all these sanctions will not really deter Russians from uh, achieving what they have got in mind. They have just said today that the first phase of their operation, military operation, is over, now it remains to be seen what is the second phase. They said in the second phase they want to secure the two speaking Russian areas to give them total freedom, give them total kind of security so that those two can continue to, they can survive and thrive. You know, that was, that was the latest about the, uh, about the Russian sources. As far as the numbers of people killed, we can never really say that for certain because both sides of course would give their own, uh, Information that nobody can, nobody can really check, and therefore it remains to be seen how many people were really murdered when this conflict comes to an end. So this conflict has caused already economic hardships, and one thing is certain, this conflict is, uh, has now given us a very clear picture of the two factions, the two powers in the world that will never again trust one another. Russians will never again trust the West, and they'll just turn to the Asian basin, and they're just going to be heading the uh, Euro-Asian power block. The West can never trust Russians again. The Russians, well, the West will remain uh, uh, gathered. The Western Europe will remain gathered around uh, around Germany. And the two will have no trust again. Uh, as far as the Americans and the Russians, I think we can say goodbye to any decent uh, relations in the future. Keep in mind, according to the Bible prophecy, no, there will be no, never war between America and Russia, so that's for sure. But, you know, as far as diplomatic relations are concerned, I'm not sure that they may continue for a long while. In his today's address... Joseph Biden, thinking that he is still a world policeman, said that uh, Putin cannot remain in power, and he also called Putin a butcher. Now, Kremlin, Kremlin gave gave an answer that your press and your media and your media outlets would not inform you about. As far as uh, as far as being in power, Kremlin responded that it's the Russian people who decide who will be in power and rule over Russia. And as far as being called butcher, <laughs> <laughs> K- 
Kremlin responded to Joseph Biden, and he, Joseph Biden, was the one back in the 1999 who was the loudest advocate of bombing of Serbia. And, uh, of course, in, when he, while he was a part of the Clinton administration, and he was the first white president of the first Catholic white president of America. So uh, Russia responded that, you know, it's really funny uh, to call somebody, someone else butcher when Joseph Biden was the one who advocated bombing and destroying of civilians in Serbia. So you see, the diplomatic relations are getting strained and uh, I don't think that the Anglo-Saxon world can expect anything anymore from, from the Russians because the U.S. has promised now to deliver certain gas supply to Europe. But however, the I think it was the Qatar sources, because Qatar is one of the greatest oil exporters in the world, I think it was Qatar sources or some other sources I've read, who said that Europe would need five to seven years in order to be able to get rid of or to eliminate uh, gas supplies from Russia and have gas supplies from other countries well five to five to seven years Europe certainly doesn't have much time uh, it doesn't have all that time because you know they have to keep their citizens warm and they depend on gas anyway so it is still expected that the Russian will continue to be one of the greatest gas exporter in the world and now that it has forced the uh, it has forced the buyers to use their currency that would secure that their currency will remain stable as I said we are all very kind of tired of this war oh yes there were reports today that the uh, city of Lvov Lvov uh, was also was also also experienced some shelling and and, and bombs no news about civilian victims but uh, there were some targets obviously around Lvov and in the city itself military targets that the Russians have hit so therefore now that's western Ukraine so you see the uh, the war can quickly spread uh, throughout Ukraine and the Russians c- could really, if they really wanted to, they could have conquered Ukraine in one week. But obviously being mindful still, nevertheless being mindful of civilians and civilian casualties, they've decided to go for the longer run. We still hope that the second phase of securing the Russian-speaking areas would not last too long and uh, we hope that all this madness would come to a war. But it's interesting how Joseph Biden, a forgetful president of the United States, does forget uh, his military campaigns in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, in Serbia, and he forgets that in his Serb-hated speeches he was calling on the total destruction of the Serbian nation. He called the Serbian nation, he said that they should be, you know, basically locked up in a concentration camp just like in a Nazi time and exterminated so uh, he has no right to call anyone butcher that's much that much I can tell you my dear friends the other day I'll just remind you it was 23rd of March Madeleine Albright one of the worst uh, criminal in the history of US and the world finally died because she was also one of those great advocates of bombing Serbian civilians and killing them uh, she died just a day before the anniversary of the uh, bombing of Serbia began. That was the 24th of March. It was the 23rd anniversary when bombing of Serbia began that evening. And I still very vividly remember that evening. And there are various things that all of us who survived the bombing of Serbia by Biden, Madeleine Albright and Clintons still vividly do remember and still have some... Uh, vivid memories that we can relate to you if you ever wish to hear them. So, uh, now after the second month of this Russian-Ukrainian conflict, we can just see more devastation in Ukraine. We see the city of Mariupol basically being destroyed. Russians have secured the land corridor between the Russian-speaking areas in East Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula. And the uh, Russians claim that their military campaign has been uh, successful so far. Uh, Ukrainians at the same time claim that they have they have halted their the advancement of Russians in certain areas and that they're still kind of successfully defending the capital of uh, Ukraine, Kiev. I really sometimes don't 
don't really understand these dumb politicians. I mean, as I said to you, it's clear that Ukraine cannot, can never win a war against Russia. So uh, I really don't understand the Ukrainian president who keeps constantly, he keeps calling on for war, calling on for resistance, calling on for humanitarian aid, calling on for foreign mercenaries to come to Ukraine and fight, calling on for uh, whatever, expecting I don't know what, you know, expecting, I don't know, he, he was, he was uh, deceived by NATO, he was bece- deceived by the US administration, he was deceived by Germany, he was deceived by EU, none of those powers wanted to have a direct conflict with Russia. So he remained alone. And uh, knowing the might of Russian army and the might of Russian country, it was obvious that he could not win the war. So it would have been better for him if he negotiated for truce and for peace, rather than allowing this kind of ongoing fights, which have claimed so many lives of so many civilians and have indeed almost completely destroyed one of the most beautiful country one of those beautiful cities in East Europe, the city of Mariupol. I'm hoping to be able to perhaps give you another update soon as you know, as soon as I hear some new new information, some new developments, I'll be very happy to share those with you. Uh, we keep hoping that the negotiations between Russian and the Ukrainian delegations would finally bear some fruit and that they would, they would stop with any further fighting. Uh, what will be the outcome in political arena? What will be the outcome in economic, in the world economic, in international trade system and so on? We are going to see in the months to come. So, uh, hopefully, the next time I, I, I feel that I've got something to tell you about this Ukrainian crisis, hopefully it will be uh, to tell you that the finally fightings have stopped, that perhaps I would be able to give you some figures from both sides, figures of those who were killed, the civilians, those who were killed, the soldiers and so on. We all hope for this, the end of this tragic conflict which has indeed affected the rest of the world. And uh, it grieves my heart once again to see the two Slavic nations killing and fighting one another. That is so tragic to me and it is so terrible. But what can you do? We are getting closer to the end of this world. We are getting closer to the establishment of the kingdom of God. And I guess these kinds of these uh, proportions of suffering like the town, the city of Mauru, Mariupol and so on, is simply something that is part of these, uh, of these new, of these end times in which we are living. So until my next installment, until my next hopefully newsworthy uh, uh, address to you, I wish you all the best, my friends, and may very soon this war come to an end and spare any further suffering and damage and destruction.